Anna, and welcome to episode 30 of the Crime Bistro podcast. And I am so excited for this one because this is a story that I've been working on for some time now. This show, as always, gazes into the thrillingly twisted world of true crime, examining real cases while we share in a passion for crime and coffee alike. For this episode, I am being boring and just having a Kirkland black coffee, so grab yourself a fresh brew or a Cape Cotter, little hint there. And let's get into the case of the Lady of the Dunes. Before we start this one off, I just want to say that this is the third time I've recorded this episode because I tried yesterday twice and it was like raining and thundering and hailing. And I live in Arizona, for those of you who don't know, so that was definitely a little confusing and concerning and really frustrating, but it's okay because we're going to get it done and I'm actually recording this in the morning, which is really new for me, so... We'll see how it goes. But anyway, The Lady of the Dunes is a case that endured for over 50 years, so for whoever's counting, that is five decades where a woman lay dead and no one could even find out her name. This is another five decades where the horrific crime that befell this woman sat with no answers and most importantly, no justice. This lasted from 1974 to 2023, just this past year where her identity and that of her vicious killer remained just as mysterious as it had been on the day that she was discovered. But finally, investigators have given the Lady of the Dunes her name back, and the case of Massachusetts' longest unidentified homicide victim has been officially closed. We're going to get into all of the nitty-gritty details of the latest updates in this decades-long ordeal, but first, we have to travel all the way back to 1974 and start from the very beginning. Now, if you don't know me, I grew up in New England, so this case is something that has always fascinated me, and with these latest updates, I am so excited to share it on the podcast today. Cape Cod, in the most objective of terms, is basically the best place ever. There is nothing that I love more than the untouched natural seashore, little galleries, antique bookstores that all smell like old newspaper archive rooms. It's honestly just such a beautiful place to visit. And being that, it's such an amazing spot to take a summer vacation, It is no surprise that this story begins with one such group of tourists. So we open here on Race Point Dunes in Provincetown, Massachusetts, which is the outermost town on Cape Cod, on the night of Friday, July 26th, 1974. The case starts just after 6pm on this Friday night, so given the time of year, it still would have been pretty light out. The following is a diary entry from Lenny Metcalf, the father of the young girl who found this body on the beach. Quote, after breakfast, I cycled to the bank and got bait and fishing supplies. Later, Sally and I cycled to the visitor center. Alyssa was at the stable. Leslie came out later with some friends in the jeep. Sal and I schlepped along the dunes to the dune shack. Some friends were there with three kids and two dogs. They were staying there for a few days. Fished a little bit. Nothing. Later, we sat at the lookout and had wine and cheese. Then Sally, Leslie, and I walked back from the dunes. The dog was barking. Leslie found a woman's body. Someone at the dune shack fetched the rangers and then gave us a ride back home, end quote. Okay, so Lenny's journal obviously doesn't give too much information about what his emotional state was on that day, but his daughter Alyssa would later say that this was pretty normal for him and he wasn't exactly an expert diary keeper. But as I just read, on that day, 12-year-old Leslie Metcalf was out with her family on the beach where she was spending some time with her friends. Leslie was a bright and creative young girl. She was very into writing, drawing, and painting, and she was described as a creative genius by her sister, but also a little tortured. Unfortunately, Leslie would later pass away in 1996 as a result of a heroin overdose after struggling with bouts of depression throughout her life, so we don't have too much information from Leslie directly about what happened on this night, but I'm only mentioning this not because of its relevance to the story in particular, but just to say that her mental state was not, according to family members, destroyed by the events that took place on this night in 1974. That day, her sister Alyssa had been at the stables, Nelson's riding stables, and when she came back, her and her sister went to the beach to play around near a dune shack that the family friends were renting. If you're not familiar, there are dune shacks all over this area of the Cape. I think there's about 15 left now. And they're pretty isolated, they usually don't have any amenities, and they're also usually used by creatives who are looking to unplug for some inspiration from the landscape. The family had been going to Provincetown for many years to spend the summer there, and they remember feeling that it was a completely safe place for their children. They would ride their bikes to the visitor center in town, and then would hike across the dunes from there, 
and it was about a 30-minute walk to this dune shack that the family friends were renting. Also, I'm really sorry if anyone hears, like, any weird background noise. There's a garbage truck right outside of my window right now, which is weird because the garbage doesn't get picked up today, but I don't know. Again, sorry. (laughs) Anyway, this night, Leslie's parents had been to the dune shack as well, so when they all started to walk home a little after 6 p.m., one of the two dogs that was in the shack, a beagle, started to follow them down the beach as they were walking back. In many newspaper reports, you will see that Leslie was out walking her dog, but the family has refuted this detail. This was most likely misreported just because they weren't really interviewed after the incident occurred. Rangers got on the scene pretty quickly. So if you do see that reported, just know that she wasn't out taking the dog for a walk. Though it's not really relevant to the investigation, I think it's still important to tell all the correct details here. Now, initially, the family didn't really think anything of this. You know, it was just a dog following them down the beach. Until the beagle steered away from them, almost as if he had smelled something, and when he disappeared into the dunes, he began to bark frantically. Leslie, who like I said was 12 at this time, even putting aside her age, there wasn't any reason for her to be alarmed by this. They were on the beach, and it wouldn't have been weird for the dog to have found trash from beachgoers, crabs, old tennis balls, etc. You never know. She followed the dog into the dunes, and when this came into view, she immediately noticed a form laying in the sand. At first, she thought it was a deer that had either been dead or injured, just because of the coloring that she noticed, which that in and of itself would have been upsetting to come across, but taking another look, she saw legs, feet, and a ponytail that was caked in blood. And as if that wasn't bad enough, just to make the whole scene even more disturbing, she clearly noted the smell of decomposition, so whoever this poor woman was, she had clearly been out in the sun for a little while. Leslie was so shocked that she couldn't even scream out to her parents and said she just quietly called to her mom, kind of like how you would approach your parents if you, like, missed the bus before school in the morning, that little, like, mom. And her mother, Sally, turned to her father, Lenny, whose diary entry I read earlier, and told him that she was not going over there. She said that she had a sense that something was really, really wrong. So Lenny went over to investigate what Leslie had found and they all immediately ran back to the dune shack where they had been earlier since they weren't too far away at this point, and then quickly took the jeep to the ranger station to alert authorities. Weirdly enough, although kind of convenient, I guess, to get them on the scene quickly, the body was found only about a mile away from the Provincetown police station. Leslie could recall some details of what she had seen, but luckily she hadn't been at the angle to see the injuries that the woman had sustained, and most notably, she wasn't able to fully register that this woman's head had sustained some injuries. Her sister, Alyssa, would later say that she thought Leslie didn't seem too alarmed by the whole thing, which was probably a mixture of shock and fear, but she did seem to have been spared from the more gruesome details of this case. She could remember, though, that this woman's clothing was folded and placed underneath her head, She had been naked, and her hands appeared to be buried in the sand. Notwithstanding, however, this entire experience was really haunting for this family. Provincetown, if you've ever been, isn't exactly a town that's, like, riddled with crime, and especially violent crimes like this, they're incredibly uncommon. In October of 2023, it was actually reported that the crime rate in Provincetown is 58.97% below the entire national average. The family who had rented this dune shack that they were visiting, though, understandably did make this the last year that they had spent there. Alyssa, Leslie's sister, described the feeling afterwards among the family as slightly nonchalant when she was told about what had happened on the beach that day. She said that her sister did have kind of a morbid streak about her at the time, so that she was more intrigued by the discovery rather than disturbed, and that it really didn't affect their daily lives too too much. Alyssa had a job at the stables, so she often returned to the dunes after the body was found to lead horseback riders on tours throughout the area, and she said that she never had any fear being there. She said that this felt like a very isolated incident, even though lots of people in the area were really talking about this case. The first person who was on the scene was park ranger James Hankins. He found the woman lying face down on a green beach blanket, and disturbingly, he noticed that unlike Leslie had said, Her hands hadn't been buried in the sand, they were actually completely missing. Hankins quickly noted that there weren't any signs of a struggle at the scene, and he said later that it almost looked like she had just been tanning or sleeping, and someone came up from behind her out of nowhere. Just like Leslie had said, there was a pair of Wrangler jeans that were folded up like a pillow underneath her head, which honestly would make a lot of sense if she had been just tanning or sleeping. 
She was far enough off the path and away from the main beach area that it's plausible she had been tanning naked without worrying about someone seeing her. This isn't something that happens a lot on the Cape, but if you go to like an isolated enough beach area, you might see some things that you didn't want to see. So it happens for sure. There were two sets of footprints near the scene, both of which appeared to be heading towards the body, but they never actually came upon it. So maybe they could have been hers and a companion, and some had just disappeared with the wind at some point. That's just speculation. Nothing has ever really come of this lead. There was also a set of tire tracks that was about 50 yards away from the crime scene, but this didn't really stand out. There's constantly dune buggies and jeeps going by all throughout the Provincetown dunes, especially on tours and stuff, so this was more than likely unrelated. Ranger James Hankins quickly made a call to the Provincetown police chief at the time, who was named Jimmy Meads. He called him at his home, telling him that he needed to get down to the scene immediately. And the news about this broke very quickly. The very next day, on July 27th, a small article was printed on the bottom of the first page of the Cape Cod Standard Times. This was the first time that the public had heard of this case, and it was the first of many articles and episodes that the paper would later write about the story. The woman's autopsy also took place on Saturday, July 27th of 1974, and they were able to put together kind of a preliminary description of what she looked like so that they could start trying to identify who she actually was. This woman was about 5 foot 6, 135 pounds, and was estimated to be between 25 and 40 years old, with an athletic build and long reddish hair that was styled into a ponytail. Due to the decomposition process, they actually weren't able to determine what her eye color was, but they did have an okay starting point for here. The autopsy noted that she had a lot of teeth missing, but they were fairly certain that the teeth had been missing before the murder occurred. Her dental records are an important thing to discuss in this case because it was one of the main methods of identification back in the 70s. She actually had between five and $10,000 worth of dental work that had been done to her teeth, and these dental records were sent to pretty much everyone that the police could think of, dentists all over Massachusetts and the country as a whole, as well as the FBI and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Because she was missing her hands and they hadn't been found with her body, it was assumed that the hands were removed to hide her fingerprints from the police, and the rest of her injuries were just as horrible. The left side of her head had been completely crushed, and the medical examiner noted that it looked like it had happened while she wasn't paying attention or while she was asleep. It was also noted that this was likely caused by a tool known as a military entrenchment tool, which is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It's basically just a shovel that can be easily carried. It's made out of heavy metal, it has a semi-pointed spade, and it could be folded and used as a weapon or unfolded and turned into a shovel. It's a great tool for campers, and camping definitely isn't uncommon among the Provincetown dunes, so that was a good possible clue to start with. She was found laying over to one side on this blanket, so it was speculated that perhaps someone she knew had been laying there next to her, and that they had hit her in the head while she was sleeping. In addition to the blow to her head, she had been nearly decapitated, and this was most likely from a combination of strangulation attempts and this head wound. They also noticed, and this is graphic, sorry, but there was a lot of insect activity on and around the body, and her stomach contents showed that she had recently eaten a burger and fries, which told the investigators that she had probably been in town shortly before she was killed. If you've been to Provincetown, you would know that these type of food stands are absolutely everywhere, and the lines can go all the way down the docks, especially when it gets really crowded into July. Obviously, this refers to today. I wasn't around in 1974 to see what the town looked like then, but... I can't imagine it was too much different. The Lady of the Dunes was laid to rest at St. Peter's Cemetery in October of 1974 with her tombstone reading, Unidentified Female Body Found Race Point Dunes. Now, someone who is constantly like listening to, watching, and researching true crime content, there are plenty of cases out there that are so horrific that they almost give me like a visceral, physical reaction. But these cases, when someone is unidentified for so long, they just really get me. There's just something that's so devastating and really eerie about it. I don't know. I just think it's really, really sad. She wasn't completely alone, though, and she did get some visits from Alyssa and Leslie Metcalf. They did pay her a few visits while they were teenagers, and Alyssa later said that she felt like Leslie had maintained some sort of connection to the case over the years. But then that being said, it wasn't something that the family really talked about all that often. 
Going back to the autopsy, it did reveal some things that were helpful, but almost nothing that pointed to who this woman actually was or who had killed her. And this was something that frustrated police from the very beginning. They were unable to find any missing persons who fit her description, and they even searched local hotels to see maybe if they had any guests who hadn't returned to their rooms, but still they just could not find anything. And one of the things that was most striking about this case to investigators was that this woman had to have had some relatives, friends, family, something. She wasn't unkempt, she had all that dental work done, she had her toenails painted, her hair in a ponytail, there wasn't anything to suggest that she was either homeless or a drifter, something like that. Now this was a cold case for a very long time, so apologies in advance because you probably know what's coming. As with many cold cases, especially those like this, there's almost no leads to go off of. We've got to bring in the psychic. We have to do it. I know. So a few years into this investigation, the police chief Jimmy Meads headed off to New York City to see a psychic by the name of Yolanda Baird, or Bard, I'm not really sure. He placed different items from the case in front of this psychic, all of which were in sealed packages so that she couldn't see what was inside of them. This one is kind of weird, though, because the psychic actually wasn't totally off base with what she said. She mentioned after pointing at one of the packages that she sensed blood and that she saw a beach where a victim was found with buried hands, which is really weird considering, like, yeah, she probably would have known about the story or maybe looked it up, but it's not like she had a cell phone at her disposal, so I'm not sure where she would have gotten that information. And what's even weirder is that she went on to give Jimmy Meads directions to where she said that he would find these buried hands. This being now the only lead that they had ever gotten in the case, Jimmy immediately went back to Provincetown and followed the directions that the psychic had given him. And after doing some searching, he wound up at a bar that was in town called the Ace of Spades. The psychic had described the hands being buried in the basement, so that's where he wanted to look. But here's where things reach another dead end and a point that's just beyond frustrating, as the basement had been cemented over only two months earlier, which essentially brought the case to a dead stop once again. Now, I know what you're thinking, because I thought the same thing here at first, too. Why wouldn't they just dig up the basement either way? Um, I can't imagine that convincing a judge to get a search warrant like that, based on what a psychic said, is very easy. Not to mention there is a very legitimate reason to cement over a basement, especially if you're up in Provincetown and it's like flooding all the time and it causes a danger to your business. So they never did search the basement, but still, it is a little frustrating. (laughs) With every new police chief in Provincetown, there was a renewed effort to solve this case and her body was exhumed a couple of times. First in 1980, it was exhumed for blood samples and then again in the year 2000, it was exhumed for DNA testing. And this case essentially sat cold from 1974 until 1987, when they got their first possible lead. A Canadian woman came forward to say that she thought the Lady of the Dunes could possibly have been a victim of her father's. She said that she had witnessed her father strangle a woman during a visit to Provincetown in the 70s, and she thought that she might have recognized her from the news. Jumping on this opportunity for more information, police contacted her back in the hopes that they could come up to Canada for an interview, but they hit a dead end right away because this woman had moved out of her home, and not only could they not find her, but she never contacted them again. So this is where I'm going to go off on a little tangent again. Um, I'm just going to assume that this person was just calling in a false lead for like no reason. And I just don't understand why people feel the need to do that, especially with cold cases like this. Like, you know, even if you think it's like fun in some weird sort of way, which I really don't get at all, it's just so disrespectful, not only to the woman, but to the people who are trying so hard to figure out what happened to her. Like, it's just so awful and like, honestly, really icky and gross. I don't understand why people do that. Don't ever call in false tips like that. That's all I have to say about it. But still, just. It, it's it's gross, and it's rude, and it's really insensitive. I don't know. <laughs> After this, what I'm going to call most likely a false tip, though, another woman did contact them, and she seemed a lot more legitimate. This time, she was from Maryland, and she said that she thought the victim could have been her sister, who had apparently moved to Boston just shortly before the murder took place, and she essentially just disappeared after moving. 
This woman said that her sister matched the height, weight, and hair color of the Lady of the Dunes, so Jimmy Meads asked for any dental records that this woman had of her sisters, which she provided. And I'm not going to leave you hanging for too long here, they weren't a match. Massive efforts were continually made to try and identify this woman, so they didn't let this case just kind of sit and fall to the wayside. Age regression was used to create an image of her when that technology became available. Clay models of her head and face were made, and genealogy would eventually be used starting in 2019. But before we get to that, we're going to talk about some of the various theories that have been produced about this case over the years, because honestly, they're all just, like, really fascinating, and I don't think I would be doing it justice if I left these out. So this one actually is super interesting, and it was a running theory for a long time that the Lady of the Dunes was actually a victim of Whitey Bulger. And this is actually a pretty compelling theory for what little evidence they did have to work with. James Joseph Whitey Bulger was the boss of the Irish mob in Boston for a very long time from the 1970s through the 1990s, and he was largely protected during this time due to his role as an FBI informant. And informant status aside, he was known as someone who was just incredibly violent, and he was actually first arrested at the age of only 14, and he was in and out of jail for many years on various assault and theft charges. Now, I promise I'm not putting on a tin hat here. I'm just including this because I find it really fascinating. And it could possibly explain some of his escalated violent behavior later on in his life. But in 1956, Whitey Bulger was convicted federally for hijacking. So because of this, he spent some time in federal prisons in Atlanta, Alcatraz, Leavenworth, and Lewisburg. But where it gets funky is that during this time, he volunteered for some experiments where the CIA was dosing prisoners with LSD and other drugs in return for lesser sentences, and who knows what kind of effect that might have had on his mental state. Either way, he was released from prison in 1965. He was known to be in Provincetown in 1974, and he was frequenting a bar called the Crown and Anchor, which was uncomfortably close to where the Lady of the Dunes was found. And strangulation was something that Whitey Bulger was known to have done previously, which is interesting considering that the Lady of the Dunes had some evidence that she had been strangled. They did find some bruising around her neck during the autopsy. But even putting that aside, we can honestly just go off of his track record to show that he would have been capable of committing a crime like this. The New York Times reported, quote, Tales of his exploits were learned from childhood there. How he shot men between the eyes, stabbed rivals in the heart with ice picks, strangled women who might betray him, and buried victims in secret graveyards after yanking their teeth to thwart identification, end quote. I'm gonna need a minute to, like, shake that one off. Okay. Whitey Bulger did die in prison in West Virginia on October 30th of 2018 when he was 89 years old. He was brutally beaten by the other inmates, I believe, with, like, a lock that was inside, like, a combination lock inside of a sock, which is just, <laughs> okay. Um, but this was basically right after he had entered the prison, only a few hours, so they definitely didn't waste any time on that one. And I'm not really a proponent of vigilante justice, but I'm not gonna say that I'm disappointed, per se. Anyway, next theory. <laughs> In 2000, a serial killer named Hayden Clark actually confessed to the murder of the Lady of the Dunes, and this was while he was serving two 30-year sentences for the murders of Michelle Dorr, who was only 6 years old, and Laura Hotling, who was only 23. All in all, he claimed to have killed 12 women, and don't worry, I know what you're thinking, and I'm way ahead of you. I know that serial killers kind of have this thing where in jail they pretend that they killed more people than they did. But he did say that he had buried some of their items at his grandfather's house, which did happen to be on the Cape, and this is where people started to find a connection between the two. Police did search this property on December 15th of 2002, and they did find a plastic bucket in the garden that was filled with about 200 pieces of jewelry. In this collection, they did find a ring that belonged to Laura Hotling, so at least they knew he was telling the truth about some of the items. Maybe not all of them, but some. And this is where the lost identity of the Lady of the Dunes really stalled out this potential lead. Since they couldn't identify who she was, no one could tell if any of the jewelry actually belonged to her. So this theory kind of ends there. Now this next one isn't really a case theory, but I think it's super interesting in like a really eerie way. In 2015, Stephen King's son Joe Hill came up with a theory of his own. 
not necessarily related to the case, but absolutely worth mentioning. He wrote in a blog post that he thought the Lady of the Dunes could be seen alive as an extra in Jaws, and there is a woman who looks just like the sketches and composites, and she's wearing Wrangler jeans and a blue bandana. Now, I don't know about this one, but the fact that she could have been seen by literally everyone who's ever watched Jaws, and even still was just laying unidentified for so long, there is just something so beyond creepy about that, I just cannot get it out of my head. And to Joe Hill's credit, Jaws had actually been filmed only about two hours from where the Lady of the Dunes was found, so it's not completely out of the question. And in response to this, one of the writers from Jaws, who was named Carl Gottlieb, I'm pretty sure that's right, actually checked his notes from the production, and the scene that Joe Hill referenced was filmed on May 25th of 1974, two months before the murder occurred. But let's really get back to the story here because we're going to bring everything full circle. The next real update in the case came in 2019 when investigators said that they were going to try and re-examine the Lady of the Dunes case using new techniques that have emerged in forensic science. They were using things like DNA analysis and family lineage genealogy. This news broke on May 1st of 2019 when a reporter from the Cape Cod Times named Marianne Bragg learned of the Golden State Killer case being solved with genealogy testing, so she reached out to the district attorney, Michael O'Keefe, to ask if they had begun to work on solving any cases in the area using those same techniques, of which he said there were two cases and one of them was the Lady of the Dunes. Solving this cold case in particular meant a lot to the various police chiefs and detectives who worked in Provincetown over the years, so it definitely makes sense that it would be one of the first cases in the state that utilized this technology for an investigation. There have only been 11 unsolved homicides since the 70s on the Cape and Islands, which made this one the oldest of the region, essentially. That same reporter described the general feeling surrounding the Lady of the Dunes case as a haunting presence in the town, so it was definitely something that people were really starting to feel a push to get solved. Using this technique to make an identification involved using DNA testing combined with genealogy testing to try and find a relative of the Lady of the Dunes. They were able to use public genealogy data that becomes available whenever someone takes a genealogy test, like the 23andMe home tests, for example, to put this method to use. And this forensic method was described really well in a podcast by the Cape Cod Times by Claire Glenn, who is an assistant professor at the Henry C. Lee College of Criminal Justice and Forensic Sciences at the University of New Haven, which I actually graduated from last year, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> Claire Glenn is a forensic DNA specialist. So DNA testing at home is relatively easy to do for those who order a kit. I'm sure that most people are familiar with this by now, but essentially you fill a tube with your own spit and send it back to the labs for testing. They use saliva because it tends to collect buccal epithelial cells, which are cells from the skin on the inside of their mouth, and they're able to extract a good amount of DNA from the samples that they collect. Scientists then extract DNA from the nucleus of the cell, removing any other cellular debris, and then they'll quantitate it to see how much DNA they actually have to work with. The tool that they use, and I thought this was kind of funny, Claire describes it as a molecular photocopier. Essentially, they manufacture copies of different segments of your DNA that they have. So they only target particular segments of the sample so that they can isolate things like your ancestry, hair color, eye color, etc. There is only a small percentage of human DNA that's actually unique to each person, so they're really able to kind of isolate those pieces. And for each person who takes one of these tests, population studies are compiled, which makes it possible for the testers to discern which each person's ancestry is. So this information is actually constantly being updated as more people are taking these home tests, and it's these databases that are being used to find familial connections from DNA samples. Familial searching can be done through the CODIS database, which is where DNA samples are stored from criminal offenders. So to simplify this a little bit, consider that you have half your DNA from your mom and half your DNA from your dad. So if someone were looking for you and they only had their mom's DNA, they would essentially be looking through CODIS for half of a match. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, obviously with this form of testing, there are definitely some ethical concerns with someone's DNA being unknowingly used in a criminal investigation. However, and this is just my personal opinion on this, 
Uh, being able to use technology to solve cold cases like this, find justice for crime victims, and especially to take dangerous characters off the streets, for me, that outweighs the negatives with any privacy concerns, but everyone is entitled to their own opinion on this, and if you don't want to worry about it at all, then just um, don't take a home test. <laughs> But scientific explanations out of the way, let's talk about the news that broke on August 28th of 2023 that this decades-long case has finally been solved. On this day, NBC Boston published an article titled Cape Cod's Lady of the Dunes Murder Case Closed as Killer is ID'd. The unknown Lady of the Dunes had been identified as Ruth Marie Terry, and at this time in 2023, her case was finally brought to a close. The Cape and Islands District Attorney's Office had been investigating Guy Maldavin as a person of interest in Ruth's death since her body had been identified in October of 2022. At the time that she was identified, and this is just awful, her biological son, Richard Hanshit, learned of both his mother's death and of his mother's true identity all at the same time. So I can't even imagine the emotions that he must have been experiencing. That must have been so traumatic. That's so awful. Ruth Marie Terry herself was born in Tennessee on September 8th of 1936, and she was married to Guy Maldavin only six months before her death in 1974, and one of the major reasons that it was really hard to identify her earlier was that she had actually married him under a different name. And I know this seems slightly weird, however, Maldavin himself was known to use aliases as well. Massachusetts State Police officially identified him as Guy Rockwell Muldavin, who was born on October 27th of 1923, but he had also gone by the names Raoul Guy Rockwell and Guy Muldavin Rockwell. Now, this is awful, but Muldavin had previously been the focus of an investigation for the death of his ex-wife and his stepdaughter, Manzanita Mearns and Dolores Ann, in Seattle of 1960, but he was never charged in relation to those murders. So, I mean, this is obviously speculation, but God only knows, like, if he had been charged for those murders, he might have never even met Ruth Marie Terry. News reports about these deaths explain that the two women had gone missing and human remains were found in the septic tank in their family home. So Moldavin was arrested by the FBI and he was charged with unlawful flight for not giving a statement to police. He was found guilty of grand larceny, but he had his sentence suspended after 15 months in jail, which is nothing, literally nothing, especially if he really was guilty of this. That's so frustrating. This in itself is horrifying and disturbing enough, but I am going to make it a little bit worse for a minute here, so just bear with me. In 1976, two years after Ruth's death, Moldavin published a book called Cooking with Rump Oil, and there is a recipe in this book, I'm using that term very loosely, titled Cape Cod Shid, that has eerie similarities to Ruth's death. And this is a quote from the book itself. Again, I'm using book as like a very loose term. I honestly don't really know what he was going for here. But quote, after the shit is caught, anything over five minutes ends it. The sweet turpentine taste will turn to that of a burnt glove and the tender look will become one of despair. End quote. I don't know what that means. Honestly, it's just creepy and weird, and it just gives me the chills. Like, <laughs> I hate that people like this exist. Moldavin himself died in California in 2002. What a tragedy. Which is where he fled to after her death, and he was 78 years old at the time. So to provide a little bit more context to the case, the Cape Cod Times reported that the two had gotten married in 1974 and they had stopped to see a cousin of Ruth's in Tennessee before they went on their honeymoon. Only Moldavin returned from the honeymoon trip, and he apparently told some people that Ruth had passed away, but then he told Ruth's brother that they had gotten into a fight on their honeymoon, and he hadn't seen her again after that. And just to give this another layer here, his family had owned property in Provincetown and frequently vacationed there. But that's enough of that, and honestly, to me, this case is not about Moldavin at all, and I think that we should really be focused on how amazing it is that Ruth Terry has gotten her name back, and her family has finally been able to find some peace and say goodbye to her. Only 37 at the time that she passed away, she was described by her family members as a loving and caring person, a free spirit who had a huge excitement for life and really just wanted to explore outside of Whitwell, Tennessee, which is where she grew up. 
She had last visited her family four months before the discovery of her body. Ruth's great-niece, Brittany Novanglowski, told NBC Boston that her grandmother had described Ruth as a person who oozed love, and she also said of her family's reaction that it is very, very sad for us because she was up there for 50 years all by herself, and further that it was just earth-shattering to know that somebody so beautiful and loved and so bright was taken like that. Her mother and grandmother never stopped looking for Ruth, not knowing that the whole time she was buried in an unmarked grave in Provincetown. In 2023, her family was finally able to travel to Cape Cod to say a final goodbye to Ruth. Her son, Richard Hanchette, who I mentioned earlier didn't know of his mother's identity until her body was identified, was on this goodbye trip and he said, quote, I want to go out there and be where she was. I want her to know that it's okay to go and that my mom's going to be able to go to heaven, end quote. He had never met Ruth, and he had been raised by a couple in Michigan, but he started to search for his biological family in 2018, and all of his questions had been answered when this case was solved. On the same trip, he told NBC Boston that when he stood in front of her grave, he said, quote, I told her I loved her, and, uh, it's when everything set in. It broke my heart, end quote. Her ashes were spread into the wind from a hill not far from where she was found, and Richard said that he felt like his job was done. Quote, I felt she'd been waiting a long time for me to come here. I just felt so at peace, you know what I mean? Like I completed my task, end quote. Some of her remains were also buried next to her mother in Tennessee, and some are now with Richard at his Michigan home. Okay, wow. Um, I'm not even really sure where to start to wrap up this case. Um... Really, I just feel like this whole story is just a masterclass on, like, why you shouldn't kill people. And I don't even mean that to sound like a joke, because I know that it sounds, like, not serious. But really, it's horrible that her family had to suffer for five decades not knowing where Ruth was or what had happened to her. And I can't imagine the strength that it took for her son to be able to visit the dunes, but I'm really glad that it did bring him some form of peace. And I'm also glad that her remains now lie peacefully next to her mother, and with the son who missed out on an entire life with her. And it's like I said before, there's just something so devastating about a case where someone is unidentified like this, and even though her case is now solved, there isn't anything that can give Ruth's family back those 50 years, and I sincerely hope that they're recovering well from the shock and sadness that finding out the truth must have brought on them. There is at least a happy-ish ending here. And I'm confident that using this DNA technology, investigators will have opportunities to bring the peace that Richard Hanchette was finally able to find to other families who have been caught up in horrific crimes such as this one. So, I mean, again, it sounds like a joke, but also not really at all. Um, Don't murder people. The way that this family was left in the dark for 50 whole years is just tragic, honestly. But that being said, that is the case of The Lady of the Dunes. And thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Crime Bistro podcast. Be sure to visit the podcast at crimebistro.com for the entire catalog of episodes, including last week's first edition of the new Coffee Chat series, which is pretty fun. Actually, if you haven't heard that one yet, go listen to it now because it'll at least bring up your mood a little bit after this horrible story. If you have a comment of your own or even a story of your own that you would like to share, contact me through the website on Instagram, YouTube, or on TikTok, and you'll also see some behind the scenes and additional content throughout the week. But with that, that story is coming to a close after 50 years, five decades. Oh my goodness. So thank you again for being here and listening. And as always, until next time. (music) 